Welcome to the Big Bass Podcast, the fishing show where size matters. I'm Terry Battisti. And I'm Ken Duke. Our producer and engineer is the great Nathan Benson. If you're a regular listener, you know we take a lot of pride in researching the stories of big bass that we bring you each week. We call it a deep dive, and it involves hours and hours of scouring the internet, census records, military records, birth certificates, old books and magazines, newspaper databases, even burial records. Yeah, and when we hit the mother load, or in the cases where we have real and, and direct connection to the story, it can be easy. And, and it's always fun, but sometimes it's a real struggle. And this episode was a struggle. Yeah, and, and coming up with a concept for this episode, um, you know, Terry and I are always thinking, oh, what are we going to do next? What show are we going to do next? And I said, well, uh, I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to try next. So I started looking through our, our state record databases and I, you can find those on our, our website, thebigbasspodcast.com. Yep. I was wondering what state had gone the longest period of time without establishing a new bass record. And it turns out that it wasn't even close. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the answer is Wisconsin. The Badger State's largemouth record was set in 1940, and the smallmouth record was set in 1950. So it's been 73 years since a state record bass has come out of the state. I mean, that's say crazy. It. Say, oh, no, no, that's not what you're saying. <laughs> that's not the word. That's not the uh, word. All word. right. It's insane is what it is. It's insane. And I feel bad for the people of Wisconsin because that is a brutally long time to go mm-hmm. without a state record. And uh, one of the first things you need to know about state records in Wisconsin, Terry, is that there are only two. There's a largemouth record. There's a smallmouth record. They don't have a record for spots. They don't have a record for Guadalupe's. They don't have a record for mean mouth. It's all down to the largemouth and the smallmouth. And and let's start uh, with the older of the two, the state record largemouth. Uh, Wisconsin state record largemouth bass is the third oldest state record largemouth in the country. It is behind only Georgia and George Perry's world record from 1932 and Michigan, which actually the Michigan record is a tie, but the older of the two Michigan bass that that constitute that tie was caught in 1934. Mm -hmm. So Wisconsin's record taken in 1940 is the third oldest. And this fish weighed 11 pounds, three ounces. We don't know how long it was. We don't know how big the girth was. I've yet to see a picture of the thing. All we what was know it about caught size, on? I, I, well, just wait. You're, you're going to be disappointed. Uh, but, but there, yeah, there's almost nothing that we know. I, I had to do such a, a crazy dive on this one just to get some interesting material to make up a show. But we know the weight was 11 pounds, 3 ounces. Don't know the length. Don't know the girth. We know it was caught on a Saturday, October 12th, 1940. Uh, we don't know the lure or bait. We don't know the rod, the reel, the line. Never seen a photo. Uh, we do know where it was caught. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was caught at Lake Ripley, uh, just outside of uh, Cambridge. Uh, it's a, a small lake, uh, 423 surfa- surface acres. We don't know what it was named after. Not Ripley's Believe It or Not. Yeah, not Robert uh, Ripley. Yeah, uh, it's a natural glacial lake, mean depth of 18 feet, maximum depth of uh, 44 feet. It's open to the public, and currently it is uh, catch and release only for largemouth bass and smallmouth bass. Yeah, the angler who caught this fish, his full name was Robert Paul Milkowski, but apparently mm -hmm. he went by Bob, as you might expect. And Bob Milkowski was born in 1925 in Milwaukee. Um had an interesting life, and, and that's that turns out to be the, the main part of the deep dive for this episode was into the anglers who caught these fish because so little is known about the catches themselves. But uh, Bob Milkowski, born in 1925, according to the 1930 census, when he's five years old, his parents are divorced, and he's living with his mother in her parents' home. His grandparents uh, are from uh, grandfather's from Poland, his grandmother's from Germany. They do speak English, according to the census. Uh, and his 65-year-old grandfather, Jacob Nowicki, works as a handyman in a foundry. His mother is 29 at the time and does not work. Um, mm-hmm. and, and this comes up all the time, it seems like, Terry. This is what I'm, I'm learning is it, it helps to be young 
if you want to catch a state record bass. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, I and mean, he catches this thing when he's 15 years old. Um, and uh, March 25th, 1943, on his well, 18th birthday. Actually, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. You, you go ahead there. Yeah, his 18th birthday, uh, he fills out a draft card. You know, obviously, World War II is right at, we're right in the thick of that. And uh, so he, he goes into the, uh, the military, uh, enlists in the Navy, and served in World War II. Um, he was, uh, what was it, five foot six and three quarter, weighed 125 pounds. Yes, blonde hair, blue eyed, blonde hair, blue eyed, uh, you know, kid. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things that, that we found out is that he supposedly graduated from MIT, which to everybody, that I know, it means the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. But when we when we dug into his uh, his timing of things in his life, you know, he goes into the the uh, the Navy at, in in June of 1943. We assume that he probably put two years in minimum. Uh, that puts him getting out in 1945 or thereabouts, and then he gets his real estate license in June of 1946. So we're kind of confused as to when maybe he could have gone to MIT unless it was the Madison Institute of Technology. <laughs> and I don't know, Ken, what else did, do we yeah, did let me, find? Let me back up there a little bit. The only place I saw that he went to MIT was in a, a very brief online obituary. Uh, because uh, Bob Milkowski died in 2014. He was 89 years old. And, and the, the very, very brief obit that was published there said he graduated from MIT. But that seems really unlikely uh, because you got to figure a guy who graduates from M MIT is going to be an engineer, right? Or a physicist. Yeah, he's okay. going to be something in the, in the hard sciences, without a doubt. But... But by the time he gets out of the out of the military, he's uh, he's getting his real estate license. He maintained it for many years, and the 1950 census, you know, it's and he, when he's 25 years old, and you think, oh, maybe he's going to be in school at that point since he had done some time in the military. He is instead working as a shipping clerk in a brewery, and still living with his mom in Milwaukee. And his, his mother works, as at this point, works as an attendant at a reducing salon. Now, Terry, is that a phrase you're familiar with, reducing salon? No, no. Okay. <laughs> I, had to, I had to look that up. I had to look that up. It's a weight reduction salon, right? Where they had weight... those old motorized yes. things that you'd put around your belly. And... <laughs> that is exactly what it is. It's, it's where you go to a reducing salon, and you're not working out. You're not dieting. Instead, they're strapping you onto one of these belts and they're shaking you on the theory that that's going to help you lose weight. Uh, yeah. Those were a big deal back in the 40s and 50s, and that's where Bob Milkowski's mom worked. So this guy who supposedly graduated from MIT, and you would expect to be a physicist or a, an engineer, he's working as a shipping clerk in a brewery. Uh, apparently, Bob Milkowski never married, never had any children, uh, he is, his mom was married several times. Uh, and, but when, when Bob died, uh, he's buried right next to his mom. They, in fact, they share a headstone. Her name yeah. was, uh, Salome Esther Nowicki Milkowski Rogaki. And I think you can only have a name like that, uh, in the Midwest <laughs> <laughs> where there are a lot, you know, where a lot of, uh, central European folks wound up settling um they're buried at at saint adalbert's cemetery in milwaukee uh and the only obit i was able to find reads in part that robert was an avid fisherman still holding the state of wisconsin record bass a wonderful man who will be missed by family and friends tally ho bob and be good yeah uh you know, if there's nothing out there that we can find, you know, this is this is what happens. And, you know, I mean, it, 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 it kind of shows us how important records are, um, you know. You know, another thing that I, it, it didn't really click with me, Terry, until uh, just before we started recording here. But uh, I found no contemporaneous coverage of Milkowski's record catch. 
By that, mm-hmm. I mean, when he, when he caught this fish in 1940, I see nothing about that fish. Now, granted, I don't have access to all the little newspapers that would have existed around that time. But, yeah. uh, but he was in, you know, he, the, this fish was caught in Jefferson County, which is southeastern Wisconsin. Uh, and, and there are newspapers in that area. They may not, they may not participate with any of the subscription things like newspaper.com. But absolutely nothing shows up about this fish until 10 years later in 1950 when it's simply listed with a lot of other fish of a lot of other species as being a state record. So there's got to be a record somewhere. Maybe we can put Stump Jack, uh, our buddy, uh, on it because he lives in, in Wisconsin, and I think he lives pretty go. close to that area. So, there Dave, go. we got a job for you. <laughs> <laughs> Stump Jack, if you could do it, that'd be awesome uh, because we're, we're mostly in the dark, unfortunately. Now, Jefferson County in 1940, when Milkowski caught this fish, had a population of almost 39,000. It's now more than double that. I think the population is about 84, 85,000 these days. Uh, yeah. The largest town in the county is Fort Atkinson. And Terry, I don't have to tell you what Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin means in the world of fishing. Uh, go ahead, Ken. Uncle Josh. Yes. Uncle Josh it. was headquartered in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. And, more pigs uh, slaughtered in Fort Atkinson uh, than probably anywhere else in the United States at the time. Uh, yeah, it was Uncle Josh's. I mean, they were huge until about 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, they stopped producing pork rind in 2015, but I've heard occasionally that they may be back in the game. Well, they are. I mean, they, they, they are redoing their, their baits. You know, right now you can get their number 10 big uh, daddy frog, or I think that's what it's called, and then the number 11, which was probably the best selling one that they had. But holy mackerel, I think they took it uh, to heart the way the, the Japanese started charging for crankbaits and stuff. Uh-huh. It used to be that you could get a bottle of four number 11 frogs or a bottle of, I think it was two or three number 10 big daddies for $1.25. Um, and, and this was up until the, the late 90s even. Maybe it was 2 bucks or two thirty five at that point. But they want 12 bucks for four flipping number 11 frogs well that's you, you put a four dollar chunk on a five dollar jig and you make a pitch and you lose it i mean holy mackerel yeah well, here, it doesn't here in Go florida ahead. we fish with 65 and 80 pound braids so we don't lose many uh but you yeah know, but if you get it hung in a piece of wood <laughs> Which you guys don't have any wood down we here. Don't have wood. You chopped all that stuff down. Well, the hurricanes ripped all the all the trees out. We got no wood. We got no rock. We're safe. Um, but yeah, so if you had to speculate on on what bait he might have caught it on, you know, maybe maybe a pork rind bait or a spoon is a is a decent bet yeah. simply because of, of the location and all. But we have no idea. Yeah, because no the upper Epinger Daredevil was was made up in that area, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, Lewis Johnson, uh, the Johnson spoon was made up in that area, the upper Midwest, I should say. I, I, I don't recall if it was actually Wisconsin, but yeah, it, I mean, pork rind baits were huge at, at, back in those days. And, uh, but who knows, maybe he caught it on a head and, oh, uh, Terry, I get, to, I get to do a visual aid since we don't have any pictures of these fish. I'm going to do a visual <laughs> yeah. aid. Here's Wisconsin. Uh, here's where the fish was caught. so it's a visual joke for uh, those of you watching on youtube and for anybody who's uh, listening to the podcast all i did was hold up my hand and and point to the lower palm Uh, yes exactly that's my map you can do the same you can do the same for lower michigan too there you go there you go (laughs) well hey i i wish we had a lot more meat to the story of wisconsin state record largemouth bass there just ain't a lot out there um anybody who can shed some light on that for us we're all ears we we want to we want to know more uh yeah if we can get in if we can get information um you know in the form of maybe newspaper clippings or something like that we could do a recap on this uh and it we we may also need a recap on the smallmouth because we have the same amount of information 
<laughs> on the smallmouth bass. So why don't you carry uh, us yeah. through the smallmouth can? Yeah, it's uh, it's a similar story, folks. Uh, Wisconsin not really strong on uh, on keeping a lot of the details about their giant fish. So the state record smallmouth, which is the oldest state record smallmouth in the country, uh, was caught on June 21st, 1950. It weighed nine pounds, one ounce, which is a massive smallmouth. At the time, it was one of the biggest smallmouth in history, Terry. Yeah. One of the very yep. biggest smallmouth in history. Yep. And uh, I, I want to say that we don't, we don't know anything about the gear the angler used. And we'll, we'll get to the angler in just a moment. But uh, we don't know anything about the gear. Uh, all we know is that uh, during the same month that he caught the world record smallmouth, he caught an eight-pound largemouth on a creek chub pikey so maybe yeah. it was a pikey yeah and in, in fact i would bet on it being a pikey because i don't know about you terry but when i read about anglers especially from that era the, the 20s 30s 40s and into the early 50s a lot of those guys had had one favorite lure and by god that's what they threw yeah absolutely well not only did they have one lure because it was you know what they threw they had one lure because you know, even though it was right after the war and things were prosperous, not everybody had, you know, high paying jobs. And I mean, because a pikey minnow back in 1950 was still a buck fifty. A lot of money. I mean, that's like twenty five dollars today. You know, it, people complain about the price of lures today. Well, yeah, they've they've been that expensive. The only time that they got cheap was in the 70s and the 80s and the early 90s before Japan flooded the market with now what is the common $25 bait. Uh, yeah, you know. when, when plastic was easy to make and durable, yeah. baits got cheap. And, and guys like you and me who came up at that just at that time, we got spoiled on cheap baits. Oh, yeah. And unfortunately, some of them were not just cheap, you know, inexpensive-wise. They were oh. cheap quality-wise, too. A but, lot of that, I mean, yeah. I mean, you... you what I remember when I started fishing, I mean, I could buy a, a Bagley's balsa bee for three ninety five or three fifty, you know, and then every once in a while Bass Pro Shops would have a, a sale for two fifty nine and holy crap, I'd I'd try to buy a dozen of whatever Tennessee Chad D B twos, for example. I remember I made a couple of, you know, purchases back then at two fifty nine. That's funny. Our but, friend uh, Lee Sisson, who designed yeah. most of those great Bagley lures of the 70s and 80s, he jokes that yep. uh, when he started, those baits were four bucks, and they're still four bucks. Um, <laughs> but, well, uh, yeah, and then he had, what, boxes in his, in his garage or in his attic or something that, you know, he would either, you know, come back from a sports show, and he'd have just hundreds of samples, and he'd throw them in a box and put it in the attic, uh, or he'd, you know, go come home on a Friday and, and bring a bunch of baits that he'd use on the weekends and he'd never take them out of the box. He had boxes and he sold them for what, 50 cents a piece, you know, at a garage sale. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Good old Lee. <laughs> uh, well, getting back to uh, the Wisconsin state record smallmouths, the yeah, oldest well, yeah. in the country. That's what we were talking about. <laughs> I have yet. Yeah. I have yet to see a picture of this fish, Terry. Yet to see a picture. We know the fish was caught from Indian Lake, which yep. is in Oneida County in, in northern Wisconsin. Oh, do I get to do my map again? Let's see. Yeah. It's up here somewhere. So <laughs> pointing the tips of the fingers on my hand to show northern Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, Rhinelander is the county seat there, and the Rhinelander Daily News is a newspaper that, that did a pretty good job overall uh, of telling talking about fishing things and, and covering the fishing beat but um could have done a whole lot better could have given us a few more details about this fish uh as in any details at all um yeah because you didn't find anything on the fish no the other than other than the the fact that it was the state record in the white ironically uh bob milkowski's State record largemouth caught in 1940. I really see nothing about that fish until 1950, 10 years later. Uh, this fish, the state record smallmouth, caught in 1950. I really see nothing about this fish until about 10 years later. It's it's hmm. shocking and disappointing. I'm sure, yeah. you know, I'll, there's, there's probably 
a, a Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources magazine dating back to that era, perhaps. A lot of states had them. Uh, and if there is, there's likely a, a terrific story in that magazine about this fish, but I haven't been able to locate it. Anybody who has it, wow, I would love to see that. If you wouldn't mind scanning that and sending it to us, we're going to give out our email addresses at the end of the show. We would we would bask in, in something like that. That's the yep. stuff that Terry and I really get a kick out of. So we want to learn more about these fish. Meanwhile, we're going to tell you everything we have been able to find out. Yeah. Yeah, so the fish was caught at Indian Lake, which is near Sugar Camp, Wisconsin. Uh, it's a 354-acre lake. It's spring-fed, not glacial, uh, or it could have been glacial, but mainly it's, it's a spring-fed lake. Mean depth and there, is 10 feet. Go ahead. I was going to say, the reason they say it's spring-fed in this case, Terry, is because it has no inflow. It doesn't have a creek or anything flowing in, but there is like a creek flowing out. So they know it's getting some water from somewhere yeah. other than, than the runoff. Right. Uh, maximum depth, 26 feet, open to the public. Uh, it's got some regulations. Minimum length for largemouth and smallmouth is 14 inches. There's a bag limit of five. Uh, and it's usually closed uh, from early March or typically closed uh, from early March to early May. Um, yeah, and... the dates on the closure vary depending on year. And I think they probably time it so it opens up on the weekend and so forth. But obviously they're trying to, to protect the spawn as best they can although that may be right uh, that, that may be uh not long enough to really protect for the spawn up there i mean i i would assume that you know in march there's still ice on the water um and uh you know so maybe they're uh, who knows what they're what they're trying to do the other question that i would have is do they allow ice fishing on it ah you know? um uh, you know, when I, say, when, I, when I say the lake is closed during that period, when I looked it up, I think they were just saying the season for bass is closed at that time. Okay. Um, I don't know that it's closed to all fishing or anything. I, I need to go back and check that out. Of course, we're only interested in bass. You know, every other fish in the water is, is either a bait fish or a trash fish. Am I right? Yep, exactly. <laughs> all right, so tell us about the angler. Ah, the angler. The man who caught the Wisconsin state record smallmouth bass was Leon. Daniel Stefanik. Uh, Leon was born in August of 1918. He was born right there in Sugar Camp, Wisconsin. Very, very close to Indian Lake. Um, his parents were from Germany or Poland, depending on which census you choose to believe. So a kind of a similar story to Bob Milkowski, the guy who caught the, uh, the state record largemouth, although, his, although Milkowski's mom was American. Uh, his grandparents were from German, Germany and Poland. Um, Leon Stefanik was the ninth of ten children and, and the youngest boy. And all of one of these kids, all but one of these kids, lived to adulthood, which was pretty unusual even for that time. Um, he had what was probably a fairly typical life for a guy born in, in a, a rural part of the country at that time, Terry. Yeah. Yeah, he, he went to school and completed the eighth grade. And, it, you know, that usually when you see something like that, it means the family's a, a farming family. You know, uh, you go through eighth grade because you'll learn enough math to get you through. Uh, you'll learn enough, you know, written English uh, and stuff to get you through. So you can actually run a farm. And, uh, you know, other than that, it's the school of hard knocks from there on out. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, that's like you said, it's, it's a pretty typical deal of, uh, rural families at that point in time. And it's another reason why they had seven, eight, nine, ten kids is the more kids you have, the more labor you have. So, um, uh, that I, he had to come from a farming family, but anyway, uh, October 16th, 1940, he filled out his draft card. Uh, he was five foot six, weighed 138 pounds, brown hair, blue eyes. So another small guy catching catching a state record. Obviously, Terry, you and I have little or no chance. We're way too heavy to catch a state record. Too, <laughs> yeah. too tall, too heavy. I don't know what our chances are know. at this point. Well, back back when I, I got out of graduate school, I only weighed 170 pounds, and uh, at six foot heavy. three, six foot three, <laughs> I was a skinny. Uh, dude, 
Uh, right, you had a chance anyway. then, but, but look at you now. Come on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so anyway, uh, January 13th, 1942, uh, he enlists in the Army Air Corps, which would eventually become the Air Force, and uh, was promoted to corporal uh, in July of 1942. Essentially, you get out of boot camp and they promote you. Uh, June, June 9th, uh, 1948, he married Stephanie Elizabeth Novak. Uh, and then in June of 1950, he catches an eight pound largemouth on a Creek Chub Pikey Minnow from Indian Lake. And, uh, yeah. we got that information out of the Rhinelander Daily News. And that's of, the same uh, month that he catches the state record smallmouth bass. Um, yeah. In fact, I can't guarantee that he didn't catch the the eight pound largemouth after the uh, the state record smallmouth bass. It's impossible to say because the only article I can find about either is this article about the eight pound largemouth, and it makes zero reference to the state record smallmouth that he caught the same month. Right. Now, also in 1950, when he caught this the state record fish, he's 31 years old. He's working as a caretaker of a summer resort uh, called Tower Ranch on Indian Lake, Terry. Um, mm -hmm. So he had a lot of opportunity to get out there. He's probably a very avid angler. Um, and and about the only other thing we know about Leon Stefanik was he passed away in February of 2007 while living in Schofield, Wisconsin. Another guy who, who basically lived his entire life in the state. Both the record yep. holders have a similar tale there. Uh, at the time of his passing, he was 88 years old. Bob Milkowski was 89 years old. They were both small guys, five and a half feet tall. They were both light guys, both in the 132, 138 pound range. Uh, Milkowski was only 15, whereas uh, Stefanik was 31. But there's a lot in common with these two record holders. And maybe the biggest thing in common was they happened almost a lifetime ago. Oh, easily a lifetime ago. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, in my the, life. The, yeah, well, I was more than a lifetime for us. Yeah, but but yeah, the the largemouth was caught eighty three years ago. The smallmouth was caught seventy three years ago. I've yet to see a picture of either one of these fish. But again, I'll bet you there is some sort of Wisconsin Outdoors magazine or something that the state was publishing back in the forties or fifties, or yep. subsequently when they ran a story about one of these fish. Maybe they even published a photograph that they had, but but since then there is little to little or no detail about what's going on with these Wisconsin records. Right. Yeah, it's there's a lot to be said. I mean, you know, you you always wish that there's a really good pedigree of uh, every record fish that you know is is claimed. Um, you know who we don't we we don't have any idea if it was the Department of Fish and Game, or if it was just that you know uh, Stefanik and uh, uh, Milkowski. the other guy Mukowski, uh, you know weighed the fish at the corner market and it was the biggest fish that you know was was caught um, and therefore you know the, the the state DNR I believe it's the Department of Natural Resources in Wisconsin just accepted it you know as well no one's we've never heard of one bigger than this so it's this has got to be the record and you know so. 1940 uh that's going pretty far back for a state record a lot of states were not even thinking about keeping state records in 1940. no and, and maybe that's why it doesn't even surface until 1950 in terms of, of making the newspapers and so forth but i'll, I'll give i'll give wisconsin some credit uh on two fronts one that largemouth, uh, 1940 is pretty impressive to recognize a fish from that that early. And with regard mm -hmm. to the smallmouth, nine pounds, one ounce in 1950, that was one oh, of the that's biggest huge. smallmouth ever recorded to that point. Um, mm -hmm. You only had, and that same year is the first time anybody had caught a certified smallmouth over 10. So um, impressive catches in a lot of ways. Uh, I just wish we had more to talk about and more detail. Yeah, you know, and and maybe you know one of our listeners uh, out there can can point us in the right direction. Um, that's the only thing that we can do, you know. Um, it's it's good that they have some records, but 
but golly, I'd just like to know a little bit more about the fish and, you know, where was it weighed and, and who certified it and, and stuff like that. Because right now it's just a number. And obviously it's a pretty difficult number to beat because nobody's even challenged it to my knowledge uh, since then. Yeah, it's, so. it seems pretty safe at the moment, but but hopefully uh, somebody's knocking on the door and we'll hear about it soon because that'll give us a chance to revisit this. Yep. Until then, Terry, uh, I think it's time to slam the door on this. Yeah, it's uh, definitely time to slam the door on this episode of the Big Bass Podcast. Thank you for joining us. We know your time is valuable and we appreciate you spending some of it with us. Uh, if, you jo- if you enjoyed the show, please hit the like and subscribe buttons and if you really like it please you know show it to, to some of your friends uh, it would help us out a lot uh, if you're a big bass junkie check out the website at the bigbasspodcast.com you'll find our big bass podcast calculator which is good for fish over 14 and a half pounds uh, and we have a list of all state record and world record largemouth smallmouth and spotted bass if you want to you know, send us an email. You can get us uh, at, at Ken at the Big Bass Podcast.com, Terry at the Big Bass Podcast.com, and Nathan at the Big Bass Podcast.com. Uh, please join us again next week when we'll bring you another story about another big bass that you will not and cannot find anywhere else. And remember, size matters. <laughs>